going through this journey of looking at the ministry of Elisha. And we start off with that early ministry that he had, and now we've moved into the, the second phase of his ministry, and that is his miracle ministry. Uh, last Sunday, we saw how he supplied the oil for the widow so that she could pay off her husband's debts, her, her late husband, who had died and left her in, in debt. And so we saw that, that miracle take place in her life and in her family's life. Today, we're going to see this ministry of how he is going to serve a family from Shunem and uh, how he is going to minister to them and provide not just one, but multiple miracles in the life of this family. And so it's found right here in uh, 2 Kings chapter 4. We're going to begin reading in verse 8. Now, we're not going to read all the scripture together. We're going to begin reading 8 through 13. So I invite you to stand with me this morning out of the respect of the reading of God's Word. And here in these first few verses, we're going to see how there is the building of a friendship, a, a relationship between Elisha and this family that takes place. And we begin reading here in verse 8. Now it happened one day that Elisha went to Shunem, where there was a notable woman, and she persuaded him to eat some food. So it was... As often as he passed by, he would turn in there to eat some food. And she said to her husband, Look now, I know that this is a holy man of God who passes by us regularly. Please, let us make a small upper room on the wall and let us put a bed in there for him, and a table and a chair and a lampstand. So it will be, whenever he comes to us, he can turn in there. And it happened one day that he came there, and he turned into the upper room and lay down there. Then he said to Gehazi, his servant, call this Shunammite woman. When he had called her, she stood before him. And that means she stood before Gehazi, not Elisha. And Gehazi said to, or, and Elisha said to Gehazi, say now to her, look, you have been concerned for us with all this care. What can I do for you? Do you want me to speak on your behalf to the king or to the commander of the army? And she answered, I dwell among my own people. Father, we ask that you bless the reading of your scripture here this morning and the, the scripture yet to come as we continue on looking at your holy word. I pray, Lord, you will bless it. You will use it to speak to our hearts, draw our attention to, to you. And I pray, Lord, that you will speak to us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Now we are going to uh, continue on and look at, at the, this entire story here in just a moment. But as we look at these first few verses, we see this relationship that's, that's being formed here in, uh, in, between Elisha and this family. I want us to first notice something that he says as he was going. As, he, as Elisha traveled around, and he went all over the place. Everywhere he went was a mission field. And the same can be said for you and for me. As we go, we have a mission field. And you go a lot of places. Maybe it's to a ball game late at night. Or maybe it's to a place of work. Or maybe it's to the, to the store. Or to the park. To the ball field. We, we got all kinds of places that we go and... There are opportunities all around for us to, one, to minister to those who are hurting. But even greater than that is to look for opportunities to share the love of Christ to someone who needs Jesus. Someone who is on a path that leads to hell because they have not repented of their sins and they are destined for hell. And they need to hear the, the good news that Jesus Christ loves them, died for them, and is here to save them. You have opportunities all around. Now, so oftentimes we either get scared, nervous, uh, too busy, and have all other types of excuses that prevent us from, from sharing this good news. But as we are going into this mission field that is everywhere, we need to open our eyes just as God has his eyes open to the needs of people so that we can minister to them and share the love of Jesus Christ so that people might be saved. As he was going and, and visiting around, he would 
regularly come into this region and come by this family. And so they there built a small upper room for him to have a place to, to stay, to rest, to, to recoup. Life is hard. Ministry is hard. Sharing the, the good news of Christ is hard. It, it is exhausting. Uh, it exhausts physically. It exhausts mentally. And if you're not recouping your body and your mind and your spirit, it can be exhausting spiritually as well. That's why it's time for us to, to sometimes get alone. We saw that example with Jesus Christ himself. He would go and be alone and spend time with God the Father. We need to do the same thing. We, we cannot continue to give, 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 and never, ever receive. So we do need to have this time where we go, and we see the example set here, this small upper room. It was, it was private. And this family, they, they fully furnished everything to meet his needs. It was always available for him whenever he came by. It was convenient. It says that they, he passed by regularly. And so this was a convenient place for him to go to, to meet his needs. And this family, they saw that Elisha was a prophet of God, a, a holy man. And they treated him just as, as if he was one of their family, as if he had belonged there all along. They didn't give him their leftovers, their second-rate things. They give, gave him the very best that they had to treat him with respect and honor and dignity. Not because anything was special about Elisha, but because there was something special about our God. And that Elisha going as the mouthpiece for God, the, the prophet of God, they wanted to give him this respect and this honor, not because of Elisha's name, but because of the name of God. So as Elisha would go and visit this family, we see that there is, just as before, we started this series looking at how Elijah had trained and prepared, had discipled Elisha to be the prophet in training. Elisha now has a servant doing the same thing. He is training Gehazi in the same manner. He is discipling him to take on this role. Unfortunately, Gehazi did not take to the training that Elisha had been giving to him. Uh, Elisha, when he was being trained by Elijah... He soaked in every word and every action and everything, and what he saw in Elijah, Elisha wanted to do. But unfortunately, Gehazi was not that type of student. Now, what I want to tell you about this is that it is our job to disciple. It is the disciplee's job to be, tr be, uh, be transformed. It is their job to learn and to grow and become more like Christ. It, it, we can't control the way they receive it. The, the results are left up to God. God does the work. But that disciple the, the person who is being trained, they need to, to, uh, to realize that it's their responsibility to, to absorb and to learn, to grow, to become more like Christ so they can be used in the same manner. You see, Elisha wants to use his servant Gehazi just in the same way that Elijah used Elisha and left him to, to, to carry on the mantle, to, to pick up that mantle and go with it. And Gehazi didn't do that. And we'll, we'll see later in, in this uh, ministry life of Elisha where Gehazi fails. But Elisha, at this point in the story, he is wanting to use Gehazi to bless this woman and to bless this family for their generosity, of their honoring God and show, showing that honor upon Elisha. And so he is wanting Gehazi to see the mighty works of God and how God is going to do incredible things, things that, that uh, uh, you or I could not do, but only God can do. And that leads us to the, the beginning of a family. A, a family will, will now uh, burst forth because of the blessings of God. So if, if the Bible's still open, I want us to look now at verse 14. Uh, verses 14 through 17 show how this family goes from a couple, a husband and a wife, to even more. It says in verse 14, So he said, 
What then is to be done for her? And Gehazi answered, Actually, she has no son, and her husband is old. So he said, Call her. And when he had called her, she stood in the doorway. Then he said, About this time next year, you shall embrace a son. And she said, No, my lord, man of God, do not lie to your maidservant. But the woman conceived and bore a son when the appointed time had come, of which Elisha had told her. Now, Gehazi was, was the, the go-between. Uh, Elisha would speak to Gehazi, and then he would speak to the woman, and, and he was kind of the mediator going back and forth between these two things. And so the woman says she didn't need anything. She was very content with the life that she had for the fact that she was able to, to do these things, and she was, felt very blessed. It was Gehazi who said, I believe that she would like to have a son. I, I feel pretty positive she did just by her own reaction, that she would have loved to have had one, but she never asked for that. It was Gehazi who saw that, that to fill maybe a void that might have been in her heart, that uh, this is what Elisha should pray about to give to this family. Now, I, I use the word prayer because prayer needs to be the foundation of what we do. Our families need to be bathed in prayer. You, our, our children, just as we saw the, these uh, children here doing the hand motions to a, to a great song that we sang as, as offering to God, children are a, a wonderful blessing of God. They a lot of work as well, uh, but it is a huge blessing from God, and each and every one of them need to be bathed in prayer. We as a church... We need to be praying for your children. Pray for, yes, specifically your children, but also those who are not yours. Because if they are a part of, of our church family, we need to be praying for them just as fervently as we pray for our own children. And I, I don't just mean that those that are in the nursery. We ought to begin there. And those that are in the preschool, we ought to definitely go to there and pray. And those that are in the, the, the treehouse children's ministry, they need our prayers, but... All those, even in our youth, they're not quite yet adults yet, even though they might think they are. They need our prayers. And so we should be praying for each and every child that God has brought into our church family, praying that God would, would uh, speak to them, draw them, and use them in a mighty way. We need to be bathing our families in prayer. Any big decision you have to make needs to be bathed in prayer. Like starting a family. That's a, a huge decision that needs to have God's direction upon that. Any small decision needs to be bathed in prayer. If you are a, a man or a woman or a boy or a girl, a person of prayer, then your prayer life is going to guide you in the decisions you make, whether they are great or small. You know, I always say there that... that uh, we don't just take our, our big burdens to God. We can take our small ones as well. Or someone might say, well, you know, that, that, that's just too great for God. I, I just talk to him about the simple things. Well, if, if we ever say anything of either of those, those natures, they're both wrong. There are no things that are too big for God. There are no things that are too simple for God or too small for God. Here is my answer to that. If it is something that's important to you, then it's important to God. We should take everything to God in prayer. And when we become people of prayer, and we are spending time with Him, and He hears our voice, and we hear His voice, then uh, everything, every decision you make, whether it's a great decision or a small decision, will be guided by the Holy Spirit. I mean, as, as Dan was sharing just a moment ago, I mean, choosing a song to sing for a, a service weeks ago. I'm not sure how, how far in advance you, you prepared that, but it probably seemed like a pretty simple decision to make, right? You're, you, we're, we've been doing this theme, uh, sticking with the theme. We're going to pick a song that's retro praise, I guess from the 90s, correct? I mean, well, let's just choose one out. That's a, small, that's a simple decision. Shannon, she's not in here right now. She's with the children in the treehouse or children's church. What song should we teach the children to, to learn the motions to? That's, a, that's a, probably a simple thing. But because both of them were being led through their prayer, 
the Holy Spirit guided them to the exact same song at the exact same time so that it can be sung on the exact same Sunday. That's incredible. All over a simple decision to make. So, folks, we need to be people of prayer, bathing in all, every aspect of your life, taking it to God in prayer, and then let him guide and dictate how your life should go. In this instance, here with the, the Shunammite woman and her family, and with Elisha and Gehazi now involved in their life, God is now going to give to her her heart's desire. Even though she didn't all ask for it. It, it, it. She didn't mention it. Gehazi just saw her own heart and mentioned this now to Elisha. Now, I want to be very careful here and tell you that God does not always give you what you ask for. Just because you ask for it doesn't mean that God's going to give it to you. I remember, going back to, to my childhood, I remember one of the very first things I ever asked God to give me. It was a go-kart. And God never gave me a go-kart. I never got it. Now, I, I, I rode in some other people's go-karts, but I never had my own. Well, it was a, and this is kind of a side story, I'm chasing a rabbit now, but I want to share this story as to why I, I believe God did not give me what I asked for. Sometimes we find out why, sometimes we don't. In this case, uh, I was probably maybe third, fourth grade. I never received what I'd asked for, but I had friends and cousins who had go-karts. And One day I was at a friend's house, and I was riding his go-kart. And fortunately, this was a nice, big, souped-up go-kart. It had a roll cage and, and everything, uh, everything that you would want in a really nice go-kart. And I'm riding this through his grandmother's farm. And I'm riding around, and I go around the trail that he told me to go around. Well, I guess I got off the trail. I was still in the field, but I guess I'd gotten off the trail somewhere because at some point I hit a rut in the field that was basically a ditch, and that go-kart did a nosedive right into the ditch, and it, the momentum just carried that go-kart right on over and landed right on top of the roof of that go-kart. Now, fortunately, I was all strapped in and buckled up, and I, I, I didn't, didn't get hurt in any way. And I landed on the best part of my, my body anyway to get hurt. It's right here. Uh, but I, fortunately, nothing was, was injured in any way. But I realized at that moment, I'm so glad that I don't own a go-kart. I, I probably would have killed myself at some point in my life because I didn't have what I'd asked for. Now, sometimes God does give us what we ask for. Sometimes he, he is part of his perfect will, and he's, he grants us what we request. But other times, he doesn't. How he answers our prayers is entirely up to him. And just because he did not answer your prayer the way you asked him to does not mean that he was not listening. And it doesn't mean that he doesn't care. It just means that he has other plans. He has a, a, other things in place all our response is, is to keep our eyes on Jesus. It's to continue praying and continue to strive to glorify him in our lives. He is responsible for the outcome. We are just responsible for the worship and ser service unto Jesus Christ. Now, I want us to move now to verse 18. And while this family is now growing, uh, we see this... Uh, that she is, has now given birth to a child, just as Elisha said she would. Her, her family is now growing. There's a, an unfortunate side to this life that every single one of us have experienced and gone through, and that is the burdens because of this fallen world. We have sufferings, sometimes sufferings that are unimaginable to others because we live in a fallen world. Let's look now at verse 18. It says, And the child grew. Now it happened one day that he went out to his father, to the reapers. And he said to his father, My head, my head. So he said to his servant, Carry him to his mother. And when he had taken him and brought him to his mother, she sat on, or he sat on her knees until noon. And then he died. And she went up and laid him on the bed of the man of God, shut the door upon him, and went out. Then she called to her husband and said, Please, send me one of the young men and one of the donkeys, that I might run to the man of God and come back. So he said, Why are you going to him today? 
It is neither the new moon nor the Sabbath. And she said, It is well. Then she saddled a donkey and uh, said to her servant, Drive and go forward. Do not slacken the pace for me unless I tell you. And so she departed and went to the man of God at Mount Carmel. So it was, when the man of God saw her afar off, he said to his servant Gehazi, Look, the Shunammite woman, please run now to meet her and say to her, Is it well with you? Is it well with your husband? Is it well with the child? And she answered, It is well. Now when she came to the man of God at the hill, she caught him by the feet. But the God... But the God but Gehazi came near to push her away. But the man of God said, Let her alone, for her soul is in deep distress, and the Lord has hidden it from me, and she has not told me. So she said, Did I ask a son of my Lord? Did I not say, Do not deceive me? Then he said to Gehazi, Get yourself ready and take my staff in your hand. Be on your way. If you meet anyone, do not greet him. And if anyone greets you, do not answer him, but lay my staff on the face of the child. And the mother of the child said, As the Lord lives and as your soul lives, I will not leave you. So he arose and followed her. Now Gehazi went on ahead of them and laid the staff on the face of the child, but there was neither voice nor hearing. Therefore he went back to meet him and told him, saying, the child has not awakened. When Elisha came into the house, there was the child lying dead on the bed. Parenting is definitely one of the greatest joys in life. It is a great blessing that God does give to us. But it's also one of the hardest things to go through in life. It's one of the most soul-wrenching things areas of life, especially when we see one of our precious children that God's given to us, we see the suffering. And unfortunately, that is a, a part of this fallen world. Because original sin came into this, this world, and because of our own consequences of our sins, we deal with suffering. Suffering that sometimes is unimaginable and difficult to walk through. We do face suffering here in this life, and we do face death. Your life, your family, your situation sometimes can seem unbearable. And here with this precious mom and what she's going through, we see that she is willing to do anything for her children. She calls out to her husband. And I, I, I find this, story, this part of the story, as difficult as it is to, to preach through and to read about, uh, I find the, the Shunammite woman is no different from the women of today. Uh, husbands, you might be able to testify to this. She calls out to her, her husband and says, hey, bring me a servant, bring me a donkey. I'm going to go visit uh, the man of God. I'm going to go visit Elisha. And he says, that, that ain't right. It's not time to go see him. Is everything okay? Now, she says it is well, but how, 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 would, how would your wife respond to you if you asked her a question? I'm fine. She says, I'm fine. She's, obviously, she's not fine. It is not well. How can she say that? How can she tell her husband, it is well, when she has just laid the, the dead body of her son on a bed in their house. It is not fine. She is putting her trust not in her husband. She knows that her husband can't do anything. Not in the servant who's going to walk with her. Not with a donkey who's going to carry her. Not even with Gehazi, the, the man who, who, who was the, the, the mediator between the two. She's putting her trust not even in Elisha, the man of God, the prophet. Her trust is in God. She knows that God is the only one who can meet this need. And she's not going to uh, take this burden to her husband. She's not going to take this burden anywhere 
but directly to him. And so she goes to Elisha, knowing that Elisha has access to God. Elisha is the prophet of God, the mouthpiece for God. And she goes. So she, she travels this 20 miles by donkey up a mountain to go and see Elisha. I see that she is willing to sacrifice of herself, of her physical being to go and do this thing just for her child. Unfortunately, there are some parents in this world that they don't sacrifice anything for their children. They think their children are there to, to serve them, to meet their needs, to do what they want. They, they live their life and the children are just, they're just there. What a sad family that is. Well, can I also tell you about another sad family? Another sad family is the, the parents who do everything to sacrifice for their children, and their children get their way on everything. That is equally just as sad, because you have now de de developed children who think this world revolves around them. Yeah, parents, we do need to sacrifice for our children. We, we go that extra mile for them, but we also need to teach them the hard knocks of this life, teach them to, to stand on their own two feet, and you don't need to be that helicopter parent to come to their rescue every single time something does not go right. You need to let them walk through some difficulty so they can persevere and know that this world is, is hard and we do suffer. But we've got a great God who is there to lift us up, to carry us through these difficulties. So there needs to be this healthy balance. I, I often use the illustration of uh, uh, anybody flown on an airplane? Probably the majority of this room have probably been on an airplane. Well, before they, they taxi down the runway, they always do the, the, the instructions. The stewardess is standing there, and she's telling you what to do in case of an emergency. Oh, well, I don't know about you, but I usually don't want to, I, I usually don't even pay attention to that part of the, of the thing, because, one, I don't want to think about an emergency. I, I don't want to have those kind of thoughts. But it's important that we do. It's important that we know where the exits are. It's important to know what, ha what to do in case something does happen. Well, one of those things is, if the cabin loses pressure and you need to wear an oxygen mask, and it, it tells you specifically in the instructions, if a, an adult is sitting next to a child, what are you supposed to do? Y'all pay attention. Y'all listen to the instructions in the airplane. I mean, our, our natural reaction would be the sacrifice of ourselves and go and put that on the child because we want to make sure the child is okay. But that's not what they tell you to do. They tell you to put the oxygen mask on yourself first and then on the child. And there's a reason for that. There's a reason for that because if you are fumbling around trying to get it on the child, you might succeed and you might get it on the child in time, but you have now passed out because you were not receiving the oxygen and, and you are now unconscious. And that child cannot help you. But if you are able to get it on yourself first, then even if that child passes out, you can then put the oxygen mask on them, and then subconsciously they are able to breathe in from that oxygen mask, and they will be okay. And so there is a method to the madness. That is a, 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 maybe a healthier way of looking at the family. Yes, we do sacrifice for our children, but we don't give up our entire identity to meet all the needs of our family, of our children, we still need to have this balance within our, our families. What we see in the case of this Shunammite family is a very strong mom. And she's a, a woman of faith. She didn't want to burden her husband. She knew that she, he couldn't do anything about it. She didn't want to burden Gehazi. She knew that he wasn't able to do it. She goes directly to the source the very one who told her that she would have a child within a year. She goes straight to the man of God. She believed in God because she saw the work that he had done through Elisha. Elisha was her access and voice to God, her, her communication to God. You have access to God, also through a person, and his name is Jesus. 
Jesus is your mediator. Jesus is the one who takes you into the presence of God so that you can talk directly to him. That is his role within our relationship. When we surrender our life to him, realizing that we are a sinner separated from God, Jesus is the only one who can bring you back and bring you into the presence of God. And so when we are, are able to talk to God, it is all because of Jesus Christ. And we see that example played out right here. Not only do we see Elisha being a type of Christ, being a mediator to God, there's another example set right here. The mom takes her precious son and lays him on this bed. He's not breathing. He's not responsive. He's dead. And just as Elisha is a type of Christ, this story right here is a picture of Christ. Jesus, when he was laid in the tomb, he wasn't sleeping. He wasn't unconscious. He was dead. He was... sacrificed on a cross, a cruel cross, to pay the penalty for our sins. And there he died and was laid in a tomb. And for three days he laid there completely dead. Not unconscious, not sleeping, dead. Because he, he loves you so much that he's willing to lay down his life to die a sinner's death on your behalf. And that's exactly what he did. And so for three days, his body laid in a tomb with no life and no breath. And it wasn't until God the Father rose him up and called him out of the grave that he arose alive forevermore. And praise God, that's, that's the, the example that's set here in this story. We see that the next set of verses, verses 33 through 37, that there are sometimes beyond belief miracles. Sometimes we see those. Most of us in this room can, can testify that sometimes there are be, be, miracles that we cannot explain. Now, those are few and far between. We don't always see it that way. But sometimes, as we see here in this story, it is... The fantastic, the unimaginable, the, the things that we cannot explain. Read, read with me here in verse 33. He went in, therefore, this being Elisha, shut the door behind the two of them and prayed to the Lord. And he went up and lay on the child and put his mouth on his mouth and his eyes on his eyes and his hands on his hands. And he stretched himself out on the child and the flesh of the child became warm. He returned and walked back and forth in the house. I, I believe that he was, once again, praying as he was pacing around in this room. And again, he went up and stretched himself out on him. Then the child sneezed seven times, and the child opened his eyes. And he called Gehazi and said, Call this Shunammite woman. So he called her, and when, he came in, or when she came in to him, he said, Pick up your son. So she went in, fell at his feet, and bowed to the ground. Then she picked up her son and went out. Now, there in verse 37, I see a very good response that you and I should have. It says there that before she went and, and rejoiced and picked up her son and celebrated with him, it says there she bowed down to the ground. What that means is she spent time worshiping God first. She is praising God for what he has just done. Folks, we need to make sure we praise God for what he does in our lives. And that even means sometimes we praise God even when things don't work out the way we wanted them to. We still offer up our praise to him. But in this case, she is praising God, and now she goes over and, and picks up her son because God has done the beyond belief miracle in this family. The, the, the power did not come from Elisha. It didn't come because he, he went and laid down his body on the, the body of this child. 
It came because he spent time in prayer first. It came because he, he went to the throne and God saw fit to perform this miracle. Elisha knows that God can do this. He saw it with Elijah. Uh, Elijah performed a similar miracle going back to, to uh, First Kings. And Elijah performed a miracle where he uh, 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 saw a family that was suffering and a child that was going to die. And now Elisha is doing a full circle ministry where the same thing is being met. If you remember, if you've been here for this entire series, Elisha asked God that he would give him a double portion of what Elijah had. And we're seeing that that's exactly what God's doing. He is using Elisha to not just do the same thing or similar things, but even beyond, the beyond the belief miracles. This is not the only time Elisha is going to raise a, a dead person back to life. We're going to look at this, and we probably won't do it this year. It'll be at some other time. We'll get, we'll get to the, the end of Elisha. But at the very end, the very end of Elisha, actually in his death, he is dead and been buried. And in the haste to, to bury Elisha, they didn't even fill in the tomb. It's still an open grave. Well, this army is now coming through the land, and someone dies. They take his body and throw it into the open tomb that's there, the open grave, and his body lands on top of Elisha. And when his dead body touches the dead body of Elisha, he jumps back to life. <laughs> now, that's talking about having a, a, a legacy in ministry even after death. Somebody like a Billy Graham, somebody who still ministers eat long after they're gone. That was Elisha. Eli Elisha... Uh, was used by God to do the incredible things. Now, we're not there yet. We'll, we'll get to that story some other time, but I can't wait to preach about the dead bones of Elisha still ministering on earth. God used Elisha to do the miraculous. Now, I said that Elisha, in this story, is a type of Christ. Elisha is, uh, was the mediator between this, this woman and God. Elisha was the mouthpiece for God. And in the story, we see the, the tomb of Christ. It's, it, these are all pictures that are pointing to the coming of Jesus one day. And just as God used Elisha to do the miraculous, he used and still uses his son, Jesus, to do the miraculous. Jesus can take you from where you are to where he wants you to be. He can take you from a state of sin into a state of holiness, righteousness. You can become a, go from being a sinner to a saint, all because of the blood of Jesus Christ. He is the one who does the work. And when he does his work, you can now be made right with God. In other words, he takes you from being an enemy of God, an enemy of the crown of, of, of God, to being a friend. Even more than just a friend, but adopted into the family of God. That is what Jesus does. Jesus is the one who, who rescues you and delivers you to be made right with God. And then finally, he gives you that eternal home with him. Rescues you from the sufferings of this world to have a home forevermore. Let's say that in this story, God saw fit that he was not going to, to uh, rescue that, that precious little child. And that mom would then have this hole in her heart for the, probably the remainder of her days because of this fallen world, because of the, the agonies of this world. But see, Jesus knows there's something even greater than the temporariness of this world. And that is the eternity of heaven. And when he prepares a place for us, we will see loved ones who've gone on before us. Not just for a day, not just for a family reunion, but for all eternity, we will get to be with them. But even greater than that, well, that we will get to be in the presence of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And our loved ones who've gone on before us, 
together we will worship the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, Jesus Christ. What an experience is that that's going to be? Has Jesus redeemed you? Has he rescued you from your state of sin and made you right with God? If you never asked him to forgive you of your sins and become Lord of your life, then today is your opportunity to invite Christ into your life. Today you can surrender your life to him and let him become Lord and give you uh, a, a eternal life and an abundant life. And he can walk with you through the difficulties of this life. But you've got to surrender your life to him. So if you never trust in him as Lord and Savior, then today as we have this time of invitation, in just a moment we're going to stand, we're going to sing a hymn. And as we stand and sing this hymn, this is your opportunity to respond. This is your opportunity to say, yes, I need Jesus to forgive me of my sins. I need him to become Lord of my life. So when we stand and sing this hymn, I invite you to make your way down the aisle and come and, and grab me by the hand and say, Brother Chris, I need Jesus. I want to be saved today. Maybe you're here today and, and God's speaking about something else. Maybe he's telling you that you need to go and share this good news with someone. Maybe he's telling you that you need to get plugged into what he's doing right here at Chestnut Grove and you need to join this church. Maybe he's telling you that, yes, you, you decided a long time ago to trust him, but you've never followed through in obedience. You've never been baptized or never made that your, your decision public. And today is that day that he, he wants you to obey him. Maybe there's something else that he is telling you right now. Well, this is not the time to shut the door, turn off the lights, and ignore his voice. Right now is the time for you to say yes to Jesus.